We're on the record. The time now is 2.41 p.m. In the matter of Deborah Ann Frazier versus Ricky Allen Frazier, case number 2010-773215-DM. There's a videotape deposition of David E. Taylor being taken at 2055 Orchard Lake Grove, Sylvan, Michigan. It is November 12, 2014. My name is Ed Boyd, the legal videographer. Counsel, please introduce themselves to the record. Colleen Renane appearing on behalf of Rick Frazier. Jerry Cavalier on behalf of David E. Taylor. Steve Jenkins appearing on behalf of Deborah Frazier. Gregory Utuma on behalf of Rick Frazier. Please have the witness for Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear, firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so we'll Yes. Since we're going to be winding up with you a lot, Mark, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, lovely. Uh, let me give you uh, a couple of things. One of them is succession of behaviors. The first one is single behavior. I want you to look out for the chewing that he's doing on either side of the mouth, pretty much probably digging his teeth into his cheek. Uh, that is quite particular and synonymous often with anxiety. Uh, probably a self-stimulation behavior. He can't control what's going on around him, but he can control the chewing that he does on the side of his mouth. mouth. It's, it's a kind of a pacifier gesture, I would suggest. Does that suggest he's lying? No, people can pacify in this way for all kinds of reasons, but it's certainly one to look out for. Here's the big succession of gestures that for me denotes, okay, we've got to really look at this one. There's really something going on. He goes from water to a steepling gesture in his thumbs, which drop very quickly, that then go to an adapter somewhere on his trousers and then back to a steeple that drops again. Do any one of those single things suggest somebody is lying? No, but all of them in such quick succession is very particular to see. So again, when I see that chewing, when I see that succession of what I would now say are probably all of them adapters, even the steepling as well, I would say, is him trying to control the environment by trying to feel confident and then realizing, don't feel so confident, better adapt here, mm, that's not working for me, better go back to here, still don't feel very confident. So individually, they can mean nothing. In, in a group and in succession, in what we call a cluster, very definitely we want to look out for those. Yeah, so I'm not going to cover the same things you covered. I may cover pieces of them. But fight or flight has kicked in with this guy. And Scott, you said it best. This guy is used to being in charge. He's in front of a big crowd. He's a big name. He's a, he's not here. And we'll see that he is out of his place here. And you'll start to see fight or flight. When he picks up the bottle, I agree with you. There's one thing. He's doing the sacred space thing. Mark, I love you captured that. But the sacred space is I got my hands in front of me and I'm doing something with them. That's a way to take back some space and take some control, make myself comfortable, whatever it is. And I always refer to that as sacred space because it gives a person room to, to think and a way to soothe self. Then he moves to the where he has the bottle and he takes the cap off. Look at his hands. They're trembling. My favorite good indicator somebody's uncomfortable when they're in an interview, when they are being in a deposition or anything else is how they set the bottle down. And they watch it make contact with the table because their hand is jittery and they want to make sure they set it down. Love that. I've seen people do it in job interviews. If you are in this position and you are being interviewed, don't pick up the bottle if you're that uncomfortable. Do yourself a favor. If you're interviewing somebody and you see them that uncomfortable and they move the glass and you want to make them comfortable, mirror that behavior. Do the same thing with your glass. You'll bring them back to some kind of grounding. Remember that fight or flight is trying to turn off our thinking brain, turn off that that prefrontal cortex or the primate portion of our brain and turn us back into other mammals like cats. And that's what's happening here. You see the blink rate increase. You see him starting to do things to try to get comfortable. If you can remember that that's happening to you and feel it when you're being interviewed, then you take control again. Curl your toes in your shoes, move your leg in, in your chair, do something comforting that's not within sight, unlike what he did here. First, I want you to know directly from me that I never touched anyone inappropriately or made inappropriate sexual advances. I am 63 years old. I have lived my entire adult life in public view. That is just not who I am. And that's not who I have ever been. Chase, what did you think of the blink rate on that one? I did count the blink rate. Oh, I hope you did. I mean, and we're yes, gonna get to it. 
Okay. I was going to say I got it too. I was going to see if your other powers is the same. I'll write mine down. All right. So, write yours down. Write the way down. to quickly calculate blink rate uh, for you is just like taking a pulse. You count how many blinks you see in 15 seconds and multiply that by four. And Scott and I may have had a different 15 second window, which would account for a little bit uh, different blink rate. Uh, but one thing that's fascinating to me right when the, this video first came up and I watched these at like 5 a.m. is his lapel pin is three and a half inches lower than it is in any other video of him I could find on the entirety of the Internet. And it's the seal of New York. So the seal of New York has gone from a place of high status. And I'm sounding like Mark here. Yeah, nice. And it's coming down <laughs> like it's like a flag lowering itself. Uh, towards towards the end, and we're getting we're getting towards the evening of his career in this video. Uh, right away, there's severity softening. And severity softening occurs when a person does not want to say the name of a crime. So we hear the word sexual assault many times in these videos coming up, but you will not hear it in association with his behavior. Second, there's no legal definition of the word appropriate. And I think he knows this. He's an attorney. His dad was the governor of New York. He was married to a Kennedy. He was married to uh, Robert Kennedy's daughter. Uh, the blink rate I got here for this video, Scott, is 89. And his baseline in his other interviews that he's done is 21. Uh, also in this video, there are two non-contracted denials. This means a person did not use a contraction in their statement. Instead of saying, I didn't do that, they say, I did not do that. That was not me, instead of, it wasn't me. So two of those. There's a resume statement, I'm 63 years old, my entire life in public view, this is not who I am, who I've ever been. On the behavioral table of elements, which you can get for free, just Google that. His score is 20, which you need an 11 or higher to be the likelihood of uh, deception there. It was reported that your income was very high. Hundreds of millions of dollars, we'll say that, because I don't want to get hung up on now the that's semantics. that's one room I wish that was true. And yet when you were in jail last week, the bond was $100,000, mm -hmm. and they said R. Kelly couldn't even afford to get himself out of jail, that a friend had to come and bail you out of jail. Well, what is your financial situation, if you don't mind saying? <clears throat> Here's the deal. So many people have been stealing my money. People was connected to my account. I went into, I went by myself for the first time to uh, Bank of America. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know what the hell was going on. When, never when, been when did you do that? First uh, time by yourself? About three weeks ago to a month. Three weeks ago was the first time you went to Bank of America Absolutely. by yourself? by myself. Because I was so tired of not knowing where my money was, where my publishing is. Isn't that on you then? Huh? Isn't that on you? A lot of it's on me. That you didn't know where your money is? Me. A lot of it's on me. And people say he doesn't but, have money because he had to pay so much in settlements. What do you say about that? Lie. There's a lot of clusters around this whole banking issue. As, as Chase said, he's, he's in the future with the banking. I would want him to be in the in his past with that. So that's a, that's a, a flag for me. Um, the, he rocks from side to side before all of that. He's like, here's the deal. He doesn't answer the, the question. King, who is, who is the best out there that you can see, she picks up on it as well. She's, she wants to jump in and question that. She's seeing more data than we are at this moment. So my guess is if she's going into that, there's something up with that. And then he answers with, absolutely, it was. That for me starts to go, we've got to now watch out for this word, absolutely. Because it seems to come around moments where we now know his probability of lying has gone right up there, right up there. So let's watch out for that word. There's a lot of blocking. I'm already seeing the suppression of his right leg, which um, which we're suspecting he is uh, right handed. That's his dominant leg. So I'm already thinking the the. The passion is rising, and I'm looking for that leg. For I'm already thinking he's going to stand. He's got, he's he's got a lot of energy in that leg already. You know that could that could start rising even more. 
she is cranking him up as well at the same time. She's already interrupting him. He has this lyricism to him again, which we'll talk about further on. And one of the things that seems to annoy him is if you interrupt his lyric, if you interrupt his, his, his rhythm, he has to go back on some words and restart because he's got something quite romantic going on with this, with this lyricism that he's able to have. And he's got these kind of looks that he's able to give Gail to try and bring her in and tease her into this story. But she's brilliant. She is having none of it. She's totally interrupting his usual patterns uh, on, on this. Uh, fantastic uh, to watch. So today we're covering Hunter Biden. And just like R. Kelly, you have an image in your head of who this is. Even more importantly, his father happens to be president. And you'll take all the baggage associated with the fact that he's the child of the president and assign all of that to him and what we're talking about. We're talking about what we see in terms of body language. We'll have some very pointed opinions. Does not have anything to do with the president. Doesn't have anything to do with anything other than what we see. Period. That's it. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. Here we go. You make just one reference to it at the book. Yeah. Is that laptop yours? Uh, it's, it, you don't need the laptop. You got a book. <laughs> you got the book. It's all in the book. And I don't know. I, I truly... The, you don't know. The serious answer is that I truly do not know the answer to that. Did you leave a, a laptop with a repairman not in Wilmington? Not that I remember. Not, not that, that you I remember. remember. No. No. But whether or not um, somebody has my laptop, whether or not uh, it was a, uh, my was hacked, whether or not there it, it exists a laptop at all, I truly don't know. Are you missing a laptop? Not that I know of, but you know, <laughs> you read the book and you'll realize that I wasn't keeping uh, tabs on possessions very well for about a four year period of time. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm gonna go Mark, I'm going to sound a little like you this time. I'm looking at character. And as we walk down the path for this guy, I'm going to tell you that if you're not old enough to know this character, you're going to have to go and look him up. There's a guy named Eddie Haskell on Leave It to Beaver. And Eddie Haskell was notorious for anytime someone could give him something like a parent, he would suck up big time. Let me see you, kid. Baby, won't you please come on? Your loving daddy is all alone. You singing? I'm just practicing for the Glee Club at school, Mrs. Cleaver. I'm sure you are. <laughs> and when they couldn't, he would talk down to them. There's a whole lot of Eddie Haskell going on in this video as, as we get into these next pieces. I'll point him out, and his demeanor changes depending upon whether he needs something or he's telling. And we're going to look at all of that. Now, I'm not saying he's lying here. I'm going to tell you he might not even know whether this is his laptop or not, and he hedges at every turn. So. We'll talk about Eddie Haskell throughout this video. I'm going to say he's now Haskelling will be the term I use. Here, he starts off by chaff and redirect. He just throws a lot of crap out there for you to bite at and see which direction you'll go. By that, I mean like a plane dropping a bunch of chaff and missiles taking off after it. He's dropping something and hoping you'll get there. He's very vague in his response. Always an indicator that somebody is getting the opportunity to avoid the question. He disclaims, he, his blink rate goes through the roof when he's talking about that, and he, and he starts to trade guilt, saying, hey, I was a bad guy, and get off my back, in other words. Um, and then he does sacred space, a thing I call closing your body and then milling, so it's barriering, keeping space between me and you, and then adapting, he's milling his hands. And then he does a whole lot of barriering in general. He's locked up pretty tight. If he's not lying, he's sure sending a lot of indicators that something's up. And if I were interrogating this guy, the heat would go really up. I would say, no, 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 no. You don't get to answer that way. You don't get to be free with this. You got to answer my question. And I'd poke and prod and push. And what you're going to see is you see that brow go up, request for approval. Anytime he needs something, and if you go back and find Leave It to Beaver and find Eddie Haskell when he's talking, hey, Ms. Cleaver, you see that forehead up. You see all that nodding when he's talking to them. All it, It's just classic. And we'll see him change his demeanor when he's talking in a different way. But for now, remember Eddie Haskell. Chase, what do you got? So the serious answer is that I truly do not know the answer to that. So this is double removal, a non-contracted denial, which means they say do not instead of don't. And did you leave it with a repairman? The reporter's shaking his head to help him with the answers. No idea who this person is doing the interview, but I would bet money that you're going to see this again. And I would also bet money 
that if I had no idea who either one of these people are, that the reporter was either paid or trained to assist this person in the interview. And uh, not that I remember, said that twice with digital flexion on his hand. You can see his hand with his hand squeezing his other hand to try to hold himself still. He's very still here. And this is when he's being deceptive, according to me. And I want you to see what he looks like when he's not here in a couple videos, which we're going to look at. And he's saying, read the book and you'll realize that X, Y, and Z. So you need to go buy my book. Go buy my book. I mean, that's the, the overall theme of this. People now ask me, why was I even talking to this young woman if I knew she was dealing with such issues? Why did I even engage with her? That is the obvious and fair question, and one I have thought a lot about. The truth is that her story resonated deeply with me. I had heard the same story before with the same ugliness, the same injustice, the same damage. Not only had I heard the story before, I had lived with the story before. My own family member is a survivor of sexual assault in high school. I have watched her live and suffer with the trauma. I would do anything to make it go away for her. But it never really goes away. I spent countless days and nights working through these issues with her and therapists and counselors. I'm governor of the state of New York, but I felt powerless to help and felt that I had failed her. I couldn't take the pain away. I still can't. And this young woman brought it all back. Mark? So, oh, Mark, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, Mark, what are you Good. Uh, empathy narrative happening there. Uh, I agree with the narcissistic tone there because uh, his brother has written that passage there. I'm governor of the state of New York. He's written it. At meant, it's meant to be powerless irony. It's meant to go, look, I'm governor of the, I'm even governor of the state of New York and I can't do anything uh, with family members who've, who've, uh, who are survivors of, of this kind of abuse. What uh, Andrew Cuomo does is to use it as a power play, not as how it's meant to be written there as being powerless. He actually puts inflection on it that makes it powerful. So he can't even help himself when something's been written for him to take his status down. He uses it as an opportunity to bring his statement, his status up. He uses something which is meant to be de demotive into another resume statement. It's quite extraordinary. And I'm sure his brother, doing the best that he can, uh, he's not brilliant at the job, was pretty annoyed at how his brother delivers on this but unfortunately what this is is kind of 101 stock uh, risk management here in that they go for the strategy of show empathy and roll out the family now if if the you know this is where in 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 a classic situation you're outside their house and the politician comes forward and the wife and kids come out to the gate and the press are around and and the wife shows that she still loves the husband and the kids are adorable and we show this beautiful family unit and then in they go again and we hope the press go away with those photos he's kind of doing the same verbally going look you know I've got empathy here it's a family situation have a look at I mean I guess it's a it's a sister or a wife or even a, a, a child I don't know who it is but ultimately look if you had any real empathy and you really wanted to use the power to make that go away you just wouldn't mention it you wouldn't bring it up in front of everybody if, if it's something that somebody wants to kind of deal with and maybe even, you know, push to one side or forget about or deal with in their own time, don't bring it out to the whole public. You're doing the exact opposite. So again, he's using his power here in a, in a, um, a rather corrupted manner, I, I, I would suggest. There, that's what I got on that one. 
Cool. Mark, no longer on the Cuomo's Christmas card list. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> he, his Christmas cards were rubbish anyway. They were all about him. <laughs> it didn't look like she went through and packed up no, I mean, a bag or anything. This, this and all that in the bottom, so it'd be kind of hard to tell if she took a little bit or I mean, it'd be easy to tell if she took a lot, but it's hard to tell if she took a little bit or not. Okay. Did she tell you anything about leaving, moving out? Not moving out. I mean, the last time I talked to her was this morning. She said she's going to take the kids to a friend's house and she asked where she was going to be. And then I've texted her today and never heard anything. But the car's, the car's here. The car's right. here. Unless somebody came and picked her up. But the people that I know, nobody's heard from her, nobody's seen her. Right. What we're seeing here is we're seeing the same question asked several times during this video we're gonna, or during this breakdown. We're going to see the cops act as a team. And man, do they ever they've gelled so well. I'm sure they've worked together a long time. These guys are great. And I'll explain that as we go along. As we get further down, I'll tell you, I'll explain to you what they're doing. Like Mark was talking about, we see these lags in his illustrators. The illustrators, again, are the things that people use when they are when their brain is emphasizing specific words and phrases like I just then specific words and phrases. So when you have a lag in your illustrators, if you say something and then it comes down or doesn't come down on time as you're talking about them, then something's going on in there. You're thinking, and he's thinking because he's, the stress level comparatively to compared to how it's going to be a little bit later on is really low. It's really low. He's just talking. It seems like he's just talking to this guy, but when he starts and we'll notice that he uses his, his hands and I believe it's the passion plane is Mark up in yeah. here when he's talking about, um, going back to your, yeah, I read all your books. So when he comes back to uh, his illustrators, he's up in the passion play when he's talking about things that he knows are true and things that he's done or he's familiar with, or he's comfortable talking about. So it doesn't mean he's telling the truth when they're up here. All it means at this point is he's confident with saying those things because he's used to saying them. He's thought those out a little bit further than the other things where he comes down here. And when he gets down here, almost in the grotesque plane, Mark, then yeah. when he comes down here and they freeze, I mean, after he ans answers the question, they, they just sit down there and he just bang, he's burning that cop. He just keeps looking at him because he's watching him to see if he needs to add any um, qualifiers to that, which later on as we go along and, and his stress level gets higher and higher, he starts adding qualifiers where he doesn't even need to. Qualifiers are the things that make your answer sound more believable. It gives it more punch, more, more oomph and things that just dress it up and make it sound like a true statement or something that's believable. So that's pretty much what I got. But are you, are you, Michael, are you honestly saying that you've only ever had one operation? Two. You've had two? As I can remember. Yeah, just two. So we see uh, this hand gesture of two. He's using the back of his hand. And I spent some time today looking at videos. This is a strong deviation from his normal behavior. He's a very open palm communicator. And this is followed by a short eye flutter. And eye flutter is, is something we do that some body language people will call eye blocking. But we also, another reason that humans do this is when our CPU is processing a bunch of information, our eyes will blink a lot. And they're asking him a baseline question here, which is pretty basic. And his eyes go to nine, nine o'clock. As we're seeing the video, his eyes move to nine o'clock, which would make me, if I'm the interviewer, that immediate eye movement, I'm going to, I'm going to remember that. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to check this in a few seconds to see if it goes back to this spot again, when I'm asking him about the car he drives, where he lives, the street address, what his house looks like, that kind of thing. And that's important. And there's a use of it, what's called an exclusion statement here. As far as I know, as far as I recall, if memory serves, those kinds of things. There's two different ways we can judge this on deception. For one, if I'm asking Scott, hey, Scott, does the guy that lives six doors down from you make crystal meth in his garage? And Scott goes, well, uh, not to the best of my knowledge. That's not deceptive. But if I ask Scott, if Scott, are you making crystal meth in your garage? And you go, uh, no, not as far as memory serves. So the, the way you ask a question determines whether or not those exclusion statements are deceptive or not. And we see the hand wave, the wiping again. And there's some very prominent lip licking behavior right after his answer with some 
and this is just a hygienic gesture and a hygienic gesture is anything designed to improve your appearance. And this is more likely to be deceptive. And his blink rate again goes from 26 to the high eighties. It was too hard to calculate the exact number. Scott, what do you got? Wow. All right. Well, when, one thing, if you'll listen to him, if you'll listen to this, you hear this little tapping noise. It's him tapping his feet and his hands on his legs. Because when he, when he first comes in and he says, um, um, when he gives that gesture of two, then you hear him put his hand down his lap and you hear it slapped out like, that's it. That's all you're getting. That's the answer. And that's as far as I'm going. Like it's, so it's like two, that's it. So that's, that's what I'm seeing there. So he's trying, so he knows that's not right. So, but he's trying to put a stop to it before he goes any further. Um, and so those are the adapters you're hearing his feet tapping in his hands, which denotes he's being nervous. He's getting wound up here. He's getting, getting wired a little bit. Um, and when you say, when you ask him if, he, if he's had, when he says how many, you know, if you had more than one, he says, I've only had two. You've only had two as far as I can remember. I remember every surgery I've had. I've had three. And I remember, and I have a story about every, every one of them. I can tell you something that happened before and something that happened after. If I came to you guys and I said, and, and I was going to have two nose jobs, if I got one done, and I said, I said, well, I'm going to go have another nose job. You go. You having another one? I'd be like, yeah, because, you know, I want to get it needs to be even smaller than that. You guys would talk behind my back. It would be a really big deal. I wouldn't be thinking. And you would say, you don't need it. would be a big deal. I would remember that. Well, I, maybe he's talking about two points of entry, nose and behind the ears. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> could be. Who knows? But... All right. That's what I got. You guys ready? By the way, Scott, if you said you were going to get two nose jobs, I would pay for the second one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what is your salary at JMMI now? From what I know, I... I From what you know? Yeah, I think it's around twenty-seven to 30000 Something like that. And what expenses are you saying that JMMI pays on your behalf? Um, well, it's the expenses under the law for clergy. So, so what are they? I don't know. You have to go research that. I, don't, no, I can't tell you. No. I, I, don't I don't know everything. There is no research I can do that'll tell me what JMMI is paying for you. Well, what I'm saying is we abide by those laws, so that's, that's where it would be. So oh, no, no, it's, sir. I'm just saying I can't tell you. I don't know. You have no idea what expenses JMMI pays for. I know a for. housing allowance. I How know much that. is that? Um, I'm not sure. Don't know. What other allowance? Um, there's. I, I don't want to misstate, so I, I, I don't know. I'd rather for someone who's professional tell you about that. Well, no, I'm asking about your personal, not in theory. What but some, you're asking no, about sir, ministry let me stuff. Let me finish. I'm answering let, you. No, don't don't interrupt. Let me finish the question. Okay. I love how he goes from from what I know to I know I don't know. There's lots of, of flip-flopping between what you know and what you don't know. Linguistically, he's not making any sense at all. Uh, you'll notice him rocking backwards and forwards right at the start as well. Self-soothing gesture, in my opinion, there. And then the last one, the 27 to 30K uh, of what he thinks his salary might be. We get the bitter taste in his mouth. There's something that he knows is distasteful about what he just said there. There's just too many red flags here to, to suggest that he's telling the truth or he's innocent mine's gonna be fairly short <laughs> sorry <laughs> um because when i when i first saw this this part and it's classic because it comes right after that when he gets sworn in he, uh, he answers a couple of questions then he begins and, and you guys get ready for this because you go ah oh, I, I can't believe i didn't bring this up so I, that's why i was kind of bummed out because i figured you guys were going to nail this right out of the gate but what you, what you see him do, his hands come down, they guard his groin area those shoulders come forward he comes for a little bit trying to guard his heart and his lungs and his stomach doing that number as his, as his shoulders come forward, that head goes down, guard that neck and he starts turtling. And that's the very first thing you see most of the time when someone is not telling the truth and you start asking them questions. First thing we do is what do you, what do you, you know, what those eyebrows go up, request for approval. And then that you start from there and you've got to get them open back up. She's not interrogating him here. So it's a completely different 
uh, situation, but he does the classic moves of bringing everything forward and getting and going down like this. Whereas the opposite of that is when they're getting ready to tell you everything, for example, in a murder, you'll see him start rocking and they'll get opened up a little bit. And that's when you reach over and you touch on the leg, blah, 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 like we've talked about before. Um, what else have I got in here? I think, yeah. The, and, and originally I thought that nose scratch was, was part of eye blocking, but I think it's just a, just another adapter. So that's, so that, that's one of the number one things people learn when they first start body languages. If you scratch your nose, yeah. it, you're lying because it, yeah. there's so many blood vessels and everything in your nose that it is sensitive, but that's the number one overdone absolute I've ever heard is people constantly yeah. talking about. I think it, it stems from a research, of course, I'm going to bring this up, but it stems from a research that was done at a university where some dude in a lab coat read questions off a clipboard and they said, you you need to lie to question 11 or whatever that, that was. And nose scratching or facial touching was the number one indicator of deception that they noticed. But it's what they didn't fail. They failed to tell us it's the number one indicator of deception when you tell someone to be deceptive, the stakes are low, and it's a college kid in a completely safe environment, knowing that there's some idiot with a clipboard in front of you. <laughs> so there's some, some asterisks in that situation to that. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever given your father money from any of your no. business ventures? No. Nothing. Nothing. Ever. Not a nickel. Not a nickel. Directly or indirectly. Directly or indirectly. Not a nickel ever. One hundred percent. No. Never. So uh, the reporter starts again. This journalist, no idea who he is, uh, looks like he's been specially coached to make sure this interview is in favor of Hunter. So this is bad. This Whoever this guy is, is, is really bad. There's more no head shaking during the initial question there. Uh, continues to shake head, only offering pieces of the questions he should be asking. These small fragments of that allow the person to just say yes or no, nothing ever, indirectly or directly or indirectly. And it's uh, it's a recipe for disaster there. So in, in Hunter, we see fidgeting and digital flexion. And the difference between these two is the repetitiveness of the behavior. If it occurs once or twice, it's not we wouldn't classify, most of us wouldn't classify that as fidgeting. We typically classify repetitive behaviors that way. And there's repetitions of the questions and phrases, direct repetition. Direct repetition is a red flag for deception. He's saying the exact words that the person doing the interview is saying. This is not a good sign. Uh, I don't know who this guy is, but it, it looks like he was trained to make Hunter look innocent. Greg? Yeah, so I'm going to do exactly what he did. Mark, play along. Mark, I'm going to use leading questions too. Mark, you never ran naked through a football stadium, did you? Never, never ran naked. Absolutely naked? Absolutely, absolutely not. You get it, guys? If I ask the question a certain way and I say, hey, you didn't do this, did you? That's called a leading question. The reason you can't do it in court is because you're telling a person the answer. Well, you don't have to tell the person the answer. If you say you didn't do this, did you? What are they going to answer? No. You say, Mark, tell me about the time you ran naked through the, through the football okay. stadium. Different story. <laughs> no, you'll tell me all about right. it. And we have evidence, so we know. But yeah. So what this guy is doing, and Chase, I agree with you, by the way, there's a there is a disclaimer in the video that says this is a CBS Viacom company and his publisher is tied to the company. So they go out of their way to say that in the video. We don't have that captured here, but they do go out of their way to say it. Didn't he's it. locked down. He's lo I, and it's not common knowledge. It's just one thing I heard them say, but he's locked down his barriering and adapting and milling his fingers. And I agree with you. He, it looks like a strong denial, except for he's repeating exactly the same words. He's being spoon fed the answer. Now, whether the guy's doing it intentionally and, you know, as a conspiracy, don't know. I'm not going to assume that, but I will assume bad questioning and giving him the benefit of a doubt where you yeah. shouldn't. Then he responds to every one of those leading questions and he does romancer again. He is eye focused. No forehead involvement because he knows he, what he's denying. The other thing is he never answers the spirit of the question. He answers the question. Very lawyer like of him. Did you ever give your father any money? I believe he didn't. 
directly or indirectly, directly or indirectly. Did you cause him to have any money? Never answers that question. Never says, look, there's no, there's nothing behind the scenes that caused my father to get money. None of that's ever addressed. He answers the question asked, just like when I asked Mark, did you ever run, you never ran naked? If I lead the question, the guy's going to tell me what I want to hear, and he's going to pay attention to me very closely because he's going to be specific. A trained lawyer who has worked as a lawyer is going to be very specific in what he answers and not answer the spirit but the letter of the question. Interrogation 101, when you're trying to get away from answering, answer the question they ask. Don't provide information that you shouldn't. That we're seeing it over and over and over here. And there's no reason for him to go to, to, to go and become Eddie Haskell because he knows what's coming. Scott, what do you got? You guys got, you guys got all that stuff. So I'll well, this say one's, this. Uh, this one's hot. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say this. If you'd like to see Mark Bowden run through a stadium naked, it was a Nike commercial. And you can Google that or don't Google it. Put it in YouTube and search uh, Nike Streaker. That's Nike Streaker. And you'll see Mark Bowden naked or nude. Furlong, Danik. Oh, we have contact. <laughs> Looks like he has more souvenirs for the crowd. I think he's got the shoes to thank. A minute ago, they were all chanting who had all the pies. I think there's your answer. <laughs> and he's off like a bull with gas. Have you ever had sex no. with anyone under the age of 17? No. Never? No. I have to tell you, it's so hard to believe that based on all that we've read. I'm going to tell you something, Gail. There's one you, I'm going to tell you something. What women said about you. What women said about me. What women? So nobody's allowed to be mad at me and be yeah. scorned and, and lie on me. Mm -hmm. So they're lying on you. That's your explanation. They're lying on you. Absolutely. 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 I think uh, everybody's done something we regret. All of us, you're watching this right now. We've all done something we wish we didn't do. We've all regretted it. And as time passes, we, our brain pieces stuff together that says, well, maybe I was in the right. Maybe I did the right thing. Maybe I've grown over that. Maybe, you know, I've, I've done the best I could. I felt bad for a long time and that's enough. You know, I, I, I did my, my sentence. So we've all done something like that. So we can relate as interrogators to a person, just understanding that the brain automatically tries to rationalize and project automatically. So it's three things that typically happen. We minimize, we rationalize, and we project a lot of the stuff that we are embarrassed about, stuff we wish we hadn't done. We talked about clusters. Let's talk about some clusters. <laughs> the denial occurs before the question. But when you're watching this, maybe there's something else that happened just before this. I don't know. So I'm going to ignore that completely. There's anti-gravity gesture on the right foot, this, this moving up during the denial. I'll ignore that as well. So there's a stop gesture with his left hand during this denial. The fingers extend out to see this, this stop gesture of don't, don't go there. We'll ignore that. Let's keep moving and we'll, we'll build a cluster. Next, we have a final claim. When he's making his final claim, he's shaking his head no before he starts to make the denial. That's a four on the behavioral table of elements anyway. This is a deviation from his baseline from every video, and I watched about an hour and a half of his videos to get a baseline this morning. Uh, lip compression during the denial, that's a four. Hand to face gesture, that's a four. Emotional eye recall movement where he's just kind of accessing some emotional state, I'll ignore it. Mismatched gestures. A four, repetition of denial times two. He said it three times, but repeated it twice, which would give him an eight. The score here is a 16 plus four is 20. Uh, so his deception score is 28 here, and he needs an 11 to be graded as likely deceptive during the statement. And I ignored four things that, that could have been scored. So what we're seeing here is a, is a big cluster uh, of behaviors here. And with that long one, uh, 
Mark, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, you know, the one thing I'd written down here, Chase, was I want to know what Chase ranks this on the uh, on the table of elements because because I started going through, okay, um, uh, you know, um, uh, head shakes, eye blocks, lip suppression, self-soothe, incongruence, single shrug, uh, you're turtling, um, shrinking. It's like, God, there's such a big cluster in there. And even with you discounting a whole bunch, he's still got that high score. What I'd got, before any of that. Oh, by the way, just beautiful chin jut battle between uh, him and Gail <laughs> right at the start. I mean, what a what a battle. Like they are both going at each other right now on this. There is a strong battle going on between them right now. Amazing to see. But we get that word that I said at the start that I was worried about. We get absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that, along with that huge cluster, is just too many red flags flying at the same time for me. That's, that's just a huge cluster, I would suggest. Did it scare you? Did you think it was wrong? A couple of days prior to, to, to the abuse starting, he started touching me just in the sense of like, panned on my leg, lots of hugs, kissing my forehead, rubbing my hand. So there had been this kind of development of physical closeness that was happening already that felt like a father. It just felt amazing. As Michael started doing these sexual acts, he started talking to me about God brought us together. We love each other and this is we how we love each other. We love each we other are. and this is how we show each other our love. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I usually associate large illustrators with a true story. However, if they're way too demonstrative, I wonder. And, you know, that all this stuff makes me feel uncomfortable. Now, also, I will say, when a person feels guilt or remorse about something, they also can, you know, they'll rehearse and get everything together before they show out there. I don't know this guy's baseline. And shame on me, I should have gone and watched a video. If his hands are normally big talking, then this is real. But if all that is overly rehearsed, then shame on him, right? I can't, I haven't seen his baseline, so hard for me to say. We usually associated large movements, lots of illustrators with telling the truth. And he does have a very clearly enunciated story as he's going through this. It's not just his hands. If he's acting, and Mark, I'll, I'll pass it to you after this. If he's acting, he's doing a pretty damn good job because his gestures, his hand movements, his illustrators, his face, everything is punctuating at the same time. There's congruency is the term you would use in body language in the messaging. If his messaging is this good, I don't know what he does for a living these days, but he should be in advertising if his messaging is this good and he can rehearse and do it. It looks fluid, it looks natural, it looks believable. There's a lot of reasons for this guy to show nervous body language as he's delivering this message. And his message is congruent, face, hands, words, all at the same time. And that's hard to, to fake, in my opinion. So I'm going to pitch that to the expert on being able to fake it. Mark. Yes, but, yes. And, and Mark, Mark, before yeah. you start, let, let, me, let, me, let me throw this up because I, I forgot to add this to my thing. Um, the first books I read of yours, you always talked about the truth pain plane and the passion plane. Yep. And I don't know if you're going to get into this here, but as we go through this, we explain what his hands are doing in the truth plane and the passion plane and the differences in those. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, uh, Greg, I got it. I got the same things written down here, which is clear illustrators and they're congruent with the story. They're very descriptive. So I think some of the kind of big demonstrative nature of it when he's coming up into passion, which is chest height here, uh, it's because he is energized about the story. We do get uh, descriptions of, of, of height, I believe, and, and, and stroking the head. And, and during all of these descriptions of the act, you get downward intonations. So there's a lot of congruency and certainty around the acts that happened. Uh, at the start, you see a lovely little gesture down in the in the truth plane here, yeah, which is an, around navel height, around uh, the couple of days beforehand, and he's and he's saying, yeah, I don't know whether it was this day or that day, and he has upward intonation on that. So there's uncertainty about the exact day that he's talking about, and then we get when he gets into the acts, 
clear, clear downward intonation and demonstrative gesture, which fits in the rhythm of what he's saying. Then we get onto how he felt around it. So the feeling of, um, uh, of a father, and then we get upward intonation. So he's very clear on the acts that happened. He's not so clear about exactly what days before leading up to it they were. And then he's, he has uncertainty around the relationships and the feelings that went on. Because then we get the upward intonations around the idea of father, God. Th those are all things that are questionable. The, what it was said to him, the motives, the relationship is now questionable. I don't think it's questionable for him as to the acts that happened, the physical things that, that happened. Um, I think you're, you're right. It's pretty tough to to falsify such uh, such a, a kind of a coalition of information all at the same time. Yes, you could rehearse it. You could rehearse it. You could rehearse it. Doesn't feel rehearsed. Doesn't feel like. Uh, doesn't even feel like good acting. <laughs> it's just like somebody telling telling the story. As they see it, there's too much variation, too much complexity for that to be a re rehearsed piece, in my in my opinion. There, but Chase, what do you, what do you got? Yeah, I think there's a lot going on here. If you look at this, I went back and I watched him several years ago, all the way up to the videos where he was on Jimmy Kimmel, and he is very demonstrative with this gesture. So that is definitely his baseline. And what I thought was interesting here is his. His body's completely fluid in speaking about the casual things that took place. When he gets to the abuse, his body closes up. The humerus bone, this bone right here, gets closer to his body. And our body is programmed from how, who knows how many millions of years of evolution to protect arteries when we get scared. So fear makes our shoulders come up. It makes our neck go like this. And these myotoclastoid muscles come out and they jump in front of the carotid artery. We have a brachial artery down here that squeezes in. The shoulders come up to protect the neck. So fear makes our body protect arteries. And we see some of that here towards the end when he's doing this. So he shows more confirmation glances at the end, more eyebrow flashing at the end. There's more upward tone at the end. And there's no more body narration except for small hand movements. So we go from big and they get smaller and smaller towards the end when he's talking about the actual abuse, as, as he calls it. And I think that this is not, even if I were going, ignoring the trauma, ignoring everything else and just going off behavior, this still would not score above a 12 on the behavioral table of elements. This would be a 10.5. What personal allowances JMM Ministry provides you or stipends for uh, housing or, or automobile or whatever? What do they provide you? You know, I, I know there are many allowances, but one that I can say is housing allowance. But in order for you to get the accurate names for what they allow, you have to talk to a professional because I, I don't want to give you misinformation. No, I'm not asking in theory what is possible. I'm asking what actually JMMI provides to you. Objection asked and answered and he said he doesn't it's know. Not, no. It's non-responsive. I just don't know. I'm just telling you the okay. truth. Okay, well that's an answer, but that's not what you told me before. Um, All right, well, I'll go first on this one. Uh, again, here he begins with his mouth adapters again, starts chewing on his mouth as they go along. And then he scoots back in his chair and he literally braces himself for this answer because it's almost like somebody's throwing stuff at him verbally as cornball as that sounds because he scoots back and he's starting to get ready. And, he, and, it's, and as he does that, his arm comes up, his right, his right arm comes up almost as a barrier uh, for those things as well. Um, then when he starts using his illustrators, they're really slow as he's using these things. And he, as he goes forward, he's like this and this. And then when he's finished, when he's had, when he said, that's enough, he brings it back forward and you hear it hit his lap. So that's the way he's using his illustrators in that point. So what we're seeing here, just so you'll know, when someone is being deceptive, a lot of times you'll always hear, oh, they move back away from deception. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. But in this case, he is, as he braces himself to start to start giving his, I want to say some cuss word answer, but he's start giving his, his deceptive answer. So Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, so he's still doing the shrinking target, the Uncle Fester look. You know, his head's still kind of shrunken down into his body. But he also, when she starts to ask the question, his face does recognition, something he's prepared to defend against. And you see him almost look happy for a minute. And then he does the request for approval, and he does that pushing away, what you were talking about with his hand as he sits back. There's not, I'm, I'm not going to cover a whole lot of body language here. As he works through the mechanics of all these questions, he also then is going about chaff and redirect. He's dumping a lot of words that have no meaning and hoping she'll pick up on one so he can move in the other direction. There's not a lot of content, anything he says. His voice tone goes to really soft because if I tell a lie and it's low, maybe you won't hear. And you hear that in people a lot. When a person's telling you something is not true and they guard and they go to the lower voice and they, they get lighter and they're leaning in so you can hear them, that's all them trying to deceive you. I listen when someone's changing tone, something is up, something's changed in their head when their volume level changes. People who are masterful at managing the situation will use that to draw you in closer. In this case, I think it's more of a, if I don't say it out loud, then I'm not gonna be held accountable. And then the, I don't know, and all of those typical ways of avoiding questions. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so the brain loves predictability and autonomy, the, the ability to make decisions. When it's in an environment where it's unpredictable to it and it doesn't feel like it has a lot of power to decide what's going on, levels of dopamine reduce. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter that says to the brain, hey, things are going to get good. We, we, we've got some good expectations out of this. So the brain gets really kind of depressed. So we use adapters. We like to manipulate the world around us simply so the brain goes, Goes, hey, we've got a lot of choice here. I can I can move my jacket. Hey, I can shift how I'm sitting right now. That causes the brain to get optimistic. So we adapt when we want the world to get better for us and we want to feel better. He does this massive adapter, which is this big shift in the chair because he's under pressure and he wants to feel better. I would say in this particular circumstance, it kind of works quite well for him because I think he gets just that little bit more confident when he's made this big move. So we might get distracted by the confidence. We might go, hey, I think these answers are going pretty well. Maybe he's being honest because look at how confident he feels. But we've got to put it in the perspective of such a massive adapter beforehand and how that may have triggered him into feeling a lot more confident when his answers really have that same resonance of untruthfulness uh, about them. There is another complaint I want to address from a woman in my office who said that I groped her in my home office. Let me be clear, that never happened. She wants anonymity, and I respect that. So I am limited but what I can say. But her lawyer has suggested that she will file a legal claim for damages. That will be decided in a court of law. Trial by newspaper or biased reviews are not the way to find the facts in this matter. I welcome the opportunity for a full and fair review before a judge and a jury, because this just did not happen. This, when we see this one eyebrow hesitantly try to lift up on his face, when we have a true emotion, versus a fake emotion. They come from very different parts of the brain. The last time you were at a, a concert and really enjoying yourself and smiling, you weren't stopping to think, oh wait, I need to smile right now. This is the time I need to smile. So when we, when we do a fake facial expression or fake gestures, they're more likely to be asymmetrical because they haven't been tightening those muscles on the face for six million years. They don't have a whole lot of practice. So that's, we're more likely to see some asymmetry there. I think that's perhaps what this might be. Uh, during the word woman, there's a single shoulder shrug here. I cannot tell if that's associated with a hand gesture or not. The uh, head shaking is during his denial, which is in keeping with his normal baseline behavior. The increased speed during denial. There's an increase in his speed, which is indicative of deception. There's an immediate mouth closure, which is different than his other ones. This one, it snaps shut immediately after that. When he's talking about a judge and a jury, 
His eyes close on specific words, just like a baton gesture. And this is, I'm using, this is a coined by Desmond Morris, if you want to read more about that. But a baton gesture is when it goes along with the cadence of what's being said. And then this just did not happen. There's more baton eye closures at all of those words. Then there's a non-contracted denial where there's a non-contracted statement. Instead of didn't, he said did not. Then there's no claim that the accusation was false. There is no claim that the accusation is false. That's a big deal. The high blink rate uh, in this video is almost a, a new baseline for him. But I cannot count that as deceptive, and I won't. Since he's been doing it throughout the entire video, I won't count this as, as standing out from the crowd. However, with a score of 11 necessary for deception to be likely, his score here without the blink rate is a 26. Yeah, all the same things you're seeing. I'm going to cover a couple of them in redundancy, but that I just think we need to cover this. First of all, when you talk about the brow up, guys, we call that request for approval or something. We're looking to you to get approval, or we may use our brow to drive home points. Many gestures, many things that we do can have multiple meanings. A great example is the one that you brought up, Chase. He's blinking his eyes, but then he goes, boom, boom, boom. And he does a non-contracted denial. And he illustrates or drives home his point with each. Much like our little friend Aaron Caffey saying, kill my parents in that video. The same thing, using your eyes to punctuate, batoning with your eyes. And that's a great Desmond Morris man watching. Great book. You go find batoning gestures there. He starts off with lip compression right out of the gate. That's from the last question. He's illustrating with his right hand. You see that shoulder moving. He, in most cases where he's talking about something negative, he's illustrating with his right hand. Positives left. When he's doing his resume statements is here. When he's saying something negative, his hands move over to here. He's doing now a lot of that, what we talked about, front of mouth talking, and it's making him sound whiny. No more gravel, more whiny sounding. One brow goes up, his blink rate goes through the roof, then he does that blink rate to illustrate and a non-contracted denial. One other thing, Mark, not only is it in a court of law, not only is it with a judge and jury, but they're going to review, not a trial, not a trial. He avoids that word wholesale. Nice. Guilty people don't like things like trials. Lots of red flags, guys. Like we said, we're Switzerland, but Switzerland, even Switzerland can see across the border. Here we are. Ali, your, your brother's widow threw the gun away. She was trying to protect you? Oh, I think she, yes, yeah. I think she was just concerned about me. Why I think did you have a gun? Concerned. Well, I did, again, you know, the period of my life that um, was difficult. It was... Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. Hallie's intent was to, to make certain that I didn't do anything to hurt myself. According to the reporting, at one point, the Secret Service went looking for the record of sale. Do you I know anything about that? Nothing. No. No. No idea. Did somebody report the loss of the gun? Oh, yeah. They, they, they had, um, at, in the moment, uh, you know, we knew that the gun was lost, that, that uh, Hallie had thrown it into a trash can, and I told her, that oh, you can't do that, um, right. when I realized that it was gone. And so she went back, and, and they, the police came to help retrieve the gun, which was retrieved. Someone had gone through the trash and picked it up, and they found it within hours, I believe. And so... That was the end of the story. But you know about the Secret Service being involved? In no, anything? I had no idea. I, I don't know whether the Secret Service were or wh why they would be, or I don't think that that's true, Yeah, uh, to my knowledge. It would wow. be very concerned that you had a gun. <laughs> wow. All right, I'm going to go first on this one. This is this is victim talk. This is I'm a victim, right from beginning to end. And he says, why do you have a, why do you have a gun? He goes in this chaff and redirect it. Boy, that's, that's just... That's a, we should put that in the book or something because that is just it's wonderful what he's doing right in there. That's really great, and he's and he goes right to that that get out of jail crack card every time because I as he's when he asked him about the gun he goes well I was the part of my life where because he's getting ready to say I don't know what was going on he's trying to to work up a way to use that to get to add it to that well I don't know what happened I don't know what was going on you know shoot I was on crack. Uh, again, we see that uh, the same thread of that hand squeezing going through there as an adapter. He looks uncomfortable. And um, 
at the end there, I'm not going to say anything because I know Greg's going to eat it alive that uh, when he's bobbing and weaving there at the end, the one that gave us the, the giggle so bad. So, Greg, why don't you go next? Yeah, so he starts off with this whole adapter barrier, the same thing we've been seeing, and then he goes into, again, Eddie Haskell. And his forehead comes up, he starts trying to placate this guy. Chaff and redirect at every turn. So my favorite chaff and redirect is he starts to puke up, hey, why'd you have a gun? Well, I was in dr and suddenly thinks, Involved with drugs and carrying firearms looks a lot worse than <laughs> involved with drugs or carrying firearms. So he re he edits in the middle of it, and his blink rate just goes. Tuk, 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 tuk. He flashes so much, I think he's doing "I'll Fly Away." You know, you could have Allison sing the song in the background, um, and then the, he starts to bounce, and he gets that little his, his foot bounce, and and as his pulse increases, he loses himself, and he starts to stammer and just trail off. And Chase, you talk about him sounding like his dad. When his dad loses place in the conversation in a speech, he does the same exact thing. He trails off and drags out. And then he's doing all that bobbing and weaving. It's just avoiding the, the incoming body blows that he's expecting because he knows he's lost. He knows he's in the middle of everything. He knows that he has no idea. He knows, not noses, he knows he has no idea where he's at in the story and he's lost himself. Not probably sure that he hasn't done so, a little bit of incrimination right in there when he says, hey, in the middle of me being a drug addicted drug dealer i also had a gun yeah i think he's probably thought for a second uh oh and so he gets kind of off track there chase what do you got yep agree with you guys i want you to notice the head nod in the beginning when he's asking him to say yes to this question there's a head nod the open hand gesture from the reporter in fact every single question in this clip when he's supposed to say no the reporter tells him you're supposed to say no to this <laughs> And when he's supposed to say yes, or he's supposed to know something, the reporter asks him the question in truthful fashion, feeds it to him with a leading question. You didn't know about the Secret Service, right? Do you know about the Secret Service being involved? No, I had no idea. This is bad. I'm not saying there's some conspiracy here, but this is really bad as far as uh, reporting goes. We could have done better. How about that? There's some immediate uh, fidgeting, some digital flexion. His whole body becomes rigid. And when he's asked... Why did you have a gun? I'll read you what he says. Because I spent some time today. <laughs> typed it out. He says, well, I, again, uh, the period in my life that um was difficult. It was, uh, but you know, I, I don't know. That's code for I was a criminal carrying a gun while I was buying drugs. <laughs> yeah. Then he asked about the Secret Service. Reporter shakes his head to let Biden know. Uh, second question about the Secret Service, reporter shaking his head to help him answer the question and not knowing the case. This looks bad. Uh, and But you didn't know about the Secret Service being involved. And then with the answer to the Secret Service, I don't know whether it was the Secret Service were or uh, why they would be or I don't think that's true to my knowledge. That's the answer. Uh, pretty interesting. That's all I got. Robert, Stop it. Y'all quit playing. Quit playing. Robert. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this. I gave y'all 30 years of my career. Robert. 30 years of my career. Y'all trying to kill me. You killing me, man. This is not about music. I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids and I can't do it. Y'all just don't want to believe the truth. You don't want to believe it. Man, Gail King, that's the most gangster shit I've ever seen in my life. She didn't move. <laughs> yeah, but she could have, right there, smokes. she could have totally got away with sit down. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I would have sat down. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. She totally could. Have. Okay, Chase, what do you got? Suggesting accusations as and defining the accusation as someone playing is is a, a really good data point here. And when he's saying, I didn't do this stuff, this isn't me. He's talking about this isn't me anymore because he immediately shifts to, which he has many times throughout this thing, he shifts to going back. It's been 30 years. Time is the healer. Time has corrected this problem already. We don't need to revisit any of this stuff. And this isn't me. So what that is, is uh, what we call an uh, inter in interrogation, some dissociative statement or a dissociation statement where they're dissociating from, that's not me. I, I'm not the person. And this is uh, 
uh, offenders tend to see past events as unchangeable. So I can't change it again, but I can change me in the future. So they have a, a tendency to kind of grow out of the capacity to do it again. And I think that's the belief that we're really dealing with here. Down in the middle, there's a hard crystal belief of, I have outgrown the capacity for this to ever happen again. We do not need to go back and revisit that. That's not me. This isn't me. What we're talking about here isn't me now. Yeah, so a few things. Um, number one, there's an old thing. Alphas don't strut. People strut around alphas to show off. She's alpha in this room because the minute you move, the person who moves the least in a situation always has the upper hand. If you ever watch people in a room and you're trying to figure out which of the guys is alpha when they're all hanging out, it's the one not doing anything. All the guys doing all this stuff around him, they're all trying to impress him or trying to outshine him. The other guy doesn't need to. And that's what she's doing here is quietly containing composure and controlling the room. And that's powerful. Great job on that. Ooh. The other piece that's interesting is I do think it's frustration. I don't think he's angry yet. I think he's just exploding. Look, you can't tell anymore, but I've got hair the color of copper. Along with that comes a temper, believe it or not. So I recognize temper when I see temper. That's temper, frustration, lack of ability to control a situation. And it's one of those things the Army will beat out of you. It's one of those things you learn the hard way when you're a soldier. But along the way, you can recognize people who can't control it and who don't know when it's socially appropriate to lose their cool. I think we're seeing him. I think that's him. I don't think there's an act because his brain is not working here. I, you know, you might say, well, he's trying to act. No, his brain is not working. His frontal lobe is off. He's in another gear now. He's in cat brain. He's just saying what comes to the top of his head. And he is frustrated, I'm sure, from what he believe, believes people owe him. And it's just bellowing out. If you don't believe that, here's another piece of behavior. His handler comes over and goes, hey, man, you, you're losing your cool and takes him away. That's powerful. It tells you what's going on. This guy didn't prep this. He didn't come in there to do it. In fact, I would suggest that at this point, he thought he would be able to hold his cool. And Gail King has gotten so far under his skin with simple questioning, simple questioning, that now he's there and he's explosive. So is he angry enough to hurt her? No, I don't think he is. I don't think he's angry. I think he's so frustrated. It's just boiling up and exploding. Now, transplant that back into a house where you're living with people and you're isolated. And for a minute, I'm not saying he did anything to these people, but for a minute, assume that your entire livelihood is attached to him because of a relationship and all that explosive behavior becomes normal. Then what? So there's all kinds of, you know, we always say truth is a complicated thing. And just because you believe it doesn't make it true. This is an interesting one to pay attention to. And then let's see where he goes next. But there's a hell of a lot of frustration that leads to explosive behavior, and we see it. Other complaints relate to the work environment. Now, I have always said my office is a demanding place to work and that it is not for everyone. We work really, really hard. My office is no typical nine to five government office. And I don't want it to be. The stakes we deal with are very high, sometimes even life and death. We have to get the job done. I promised you that I would, and I will. But now, a number of complaints target female managers, which smacks to me of a double standard. First, when have you ever seen male managers maligned and villainized for working long hours or holding people accountable or for being tough? A strong male manager is respected and rewarded, but a strong female manager is ridiculed and stereotyped. It is a double standard. It is sexist and it must be challenged. Also, remember where we are. Today, we are living in a superheated, if not toxic, political environment. That shouldn't be lost on anyone. Politics and bias are interwoven throughout every aspect of this situation. One would be naive 
to think otherwise. And New Yorkers are not naive. <laughs> what the hell is he talking people? about? Where's, where, where's he going with that oh, one? I want to go first on this I one. I love it. <laughs> All right, Greg, go ahead. What do you got? Oh, I, lo I love this. Now he's doing something he knows how to do. He's a politician. He can talk without meaning, and he's doing a hell of a lot of it. He's chaffing and redirecting, but it's on a grand scale. He's filibustering is what he's doing. He's just spewing words and hoping one of them is good enough that you'll pick it up and run with it. But then he takes holy ground. He, he, took, he takes the Bill Clinton playbook, I got work to do for the American people. And even then goes and says, well, if you were naive, you would believe this. But of course you're not naive. Don't be foolish. You're not naive. You don't believe any of this. This is one of the best garbage out of your mouth things I've ever heard. This is two minutes of absolute nothing. And when he didn't spend two minutes talking about the crime, he spent a lot of time talking about his experience with his family member and then why he was better than that. Two minutes talking about God knows what this is. You could, this is AI. AI could create this on your cell phone just by punching in data and letting it finish the sentence. This is absolute nonsense. Is chaff and redirect, and it's an opportunity to get away from what he's covered before. He does cover a handful of other things, of course, righteous causes, and his body language is right because he's a politician. He gets righteous indignation. The chin comes up. He throws out that throat, and then when things are really horrible, he covers his throat again. It's, the body language is there because he's politicking. That's what he does. And there's no alarm bells going off in your head or, or any thoughts like that. Really, it's just, I love this person and, and uh, th we're trying to make each other happy. He said, oh, I was his first. But even as a kid, you don't even know what that means. So your lovers and your best friends. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, uh, same thing. I call this the organ of communication or connection, right? Your forehead, I constantly, we constantly use our forehead. We use our forehead to signal recognition. We use our forehead to signal grief unintentionally. We ask for approval. We use our forehead in all kinds of ways. I browbeat you. And you can see he's trying to make connection with the interviewer, with Gail. And he's, his brow is constantly moving as he's asking the question and talking. But I don't see it as request for approval like I'm lying and I want you to believe me. I think it's more of the, vulnerable, do you believe me? Do you trust me? Are you judging me kind of a look when the, the brow is constantly moving and the, his messaging is almost like he's asking for approval. His body's getting smaller. I don't see him as lying. I don't see a lot of signs of deception because I look for messaging to all tie together. Again, his, his story is moving along what he's saying. While it might seem awkward to us for him to say we were in a loving relationship kind of a thing, it, for him at that time, whatever he was told is what his brain is saying, or whatever he recalls being told is what his brain is saying. If he's lying, he's got his rhythm down, all of his body language and his gestures there, and he's asking for approval like a child who would have been in the wrong kind of relationship by no fault of his own might do. Because, guys, this is how we have to be careful. People ask us this all the time. When you're asking and interrogating people, if you're interviewing somebody who has been the victim of, some, of a crime, it's really easy to confuse their lack of thorough facts with deception because the way our brain works is under duress, like the first guy may have been, we don't lay down the same kind of memories we do when we are relaxed. And you know, a child, somebody who has gone through this, they're gonna have memories of things and sketchy pieces. And it's very difficult to figure out exactly what's true and what isn't. And so you have to try to remove your own biases in either way, whether it's you believe Michael Jackson did something or you don't. What we're looking at is fluid movement that looks like he's signaling what he's saying. That's mine. Right. Well, I've also I've, I've seen a couple other uh, interviews with people who have who have been who are, have accused him of this as well. And one of the guys said uh, he also said he was he was the only one or he was his first. This is the first one he's, he's been like this with. So that seems to be a, a common theme through, throughout that. And with this guy we're talking, we're, we're looking at now, again, he's, he's, he's fairly comfortable. He's loping. And I mean comfortable as in delivering the story in the state that he's in because it's probably the state he gets in every time he, he's doing that. Everything looks the way it should to me. The only thing that bothers me is he, he places the situation in third person. He separates himself from it, which is quite common in these things because he says, you don't understand this and you're not, you're not aware of this and you don't do this as he's telling that story. And that's when he, that's, I think this is the only time he does that. So that's kind of, that kind of bothers me, but I know the differences in that. But if you're looking for that, because I think we've talked about it before, 
that's what's happening here. He's uncomfortable with it. It's something that's a traumatic uh, thing that's happened to him. So he is separating himself from it. That's one way to do it. So you'll quite often hear him, hear the, the victim talk that way. I didn't see any deception in, in this one at all either. So that's short and to the point from my part. And Chase, you had something you were going to talk about? Yeah, we talked a lot about baselining in this video, a whole lot about deviations from baseline, what a person's baseline is. There's some great scientific research on this from accredited universities and, and well-respected journals. I put some stuff together. I even made a website for you guys to go to. It is scottrouseishandsome.com. You guys can go to this website right now. All of the baseline research is there right now. Knock it out, Tan Daddy. There you go. <laughs> Is that real? That's a real website. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going there now. Okay, I thought you were messing with me. Now. Okay. Oh, oh man. The behavior panel. Tandaddy.com yeah, is available. But oh, are- shit. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> That's an expensive gag. That's funny. Oh, Lord. Get the research on the baseline. Oh, no, dude, don't. Is this going to be a bunch of pictures? That's good. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, handsomeness. Oh, uh, good. good Lord. Very Case nice. Very there. nice job, Chase. Uh, that is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's good. Okay, you got me. You stung me. <laughs>